finally, it's uh, now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Repeatedly in this House, we have warned about a crisis in corrections, that the, the state of our correctional facilities are endangering inmates and officers who work there. Because of this government's negligence, the crisis has moved into our communities and is threatening the safety of Ontario families. Today, there was a shocking report in the Globe and Mail that says, due to persistent lockdowns at Ontario jails, convicted offenders are regularly getting extra credit for pre-trial custody. In one case, a convicted offender has had his sentence for a firearms offence reduced by three months because of the appalling conditions he had to endure at the Toronto South Detention Centre. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell Ontarians why she's giving gun-toting criminals a get-out-of-jail-free pass? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the minister will want to comment on the reforms that are taking place uh, as we speak. Mr. Speaker, um, we've been very clear that uh, we know that it is uh, an extremely high priority for all Ontarians that we have safety inside of our correctional uh, facilities, Mr. Speaker, and uh, on the streets of, uh, of this province. And so, Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward with a strategy for Safer Ontario. Uh, we understand that there needs to be transformation within the system, Mr. Speaker, and that goes, that goes to safety for the people who work within facilities, Mr. Speaker, and safety for, uh, for the inmates. I would also say, Mr. Speaker, that it is very important to us that we move uh, more to a, a system where there is real Rehabilitation, Mr. Speaker, that we put back some of the some of the uh, the supports that uh, that are needed, Mr. Speaker. We know that there are literacy issues in our uh, our facilities, Mr. Speaker. We know that there are Thank mental you. health concerns. We need to act. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Premier has not addressed the shocking Global Mail report that convicted criminals are getting out early because of the conditions of provincial facilities. This winter, I went up and visited the Thunder Order. Bay Jail. I found the conditions shocking. I challenged. Stop the clock. Okay, I've said order once to hopefully stop it. If it continues, I'll go to the individual. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I challenge the Premier to visit the Provincial Correctional Facility in Thunder Bay. Yeah. If that is too far, my challenge today is will you visit the Toronto South Detention Centre? Because the reality is the conditions in these provincial facilities are allowing convicted criminals to get out early. Will the Premier commit to visiting one of the correctional facilities, no matter how close or how far it is, will the Premier commit to visiting, yes or no? I don't want to hear about previous visits two years ago for ribbon cu cuttings. Will you visit and see the Question. conditions today? You see the police? You see the police? Uh, first, I'd like to ask the government side to s try to stop doing my job. I'll take care of it. Second of all, just a, a gentle reminder, please, uh, to the chair, um, you, you can you can still ask the same question, but just ask it to me, uh, Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, as I have told this House many times, I have visited uh, corrections facilities, Mr. Speaker, and I will do so again. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, the most important thing is that we understand what the transformations are that are necessary, Mr. Speaker. What are the better rehabilitation and? Uh, yeah goes both way the member from Dufferin Callan Premier No I understand Mr Speaker that the party opposite has a totally different philosophy on this front than we do Mr Speaker I understand that the leader of the opposition sat in a government that actually believed that more incarceration that bigger jails that more people Member from Leeds Granville Carry on. That more people in jail was the way to go. Mr. Speaker, I actually believe that having facilities that support rehabilitation, that provide activities, that provide mental health, that provide rehabilitation Answer. services, that that's what needs to happen in our system, Mr. Speaker. That Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. This crisis in corrections is going to escalate. Right. The reality is this is not about rehabilitation. This is about the conditions of the facilities. Exactly. The mayor of Thunder Bay called the correctional facility up there a rat hole. The right. conditions in these jails are allowing convicted criminals to get out early. That's what I'm hoping, Mr. Speaker, that the Premier will address. What I have heard from correctional officers across the province is the conditions. The conditions are deplorable. What we've seen, Mr. Speaker, is a loophole. A loophole that is allowing convicted criminals to get out early. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier commit that she will close this loophole? Will the Premier commit that she will stand up for public safety, stand up for Ontario families, and make sure that our communities are safe? Deputy House Leader, come to order. Be safety and correction services, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, Minister. thank you very much uh, uh, for the opportunity to respond because the, the loophole that the member opposite is talking about is a federal piece of legislation that he voted for. That's the loophole that he's talking about, Speaker. The problem that the problem that we are facing in correctional services today in terms of overcapacity, which is true, Speaker, across the country, is a result. Everybody, uh, calm down. All right, that'll do. A reminder: provincial policy. Thank you. Speaker, the challenges that, uh, in terms of capacity that are being faced by correctional services in, in Ontario and across the country, and I have had the chance to speak with other ministers as well, is a direct result of the dumb on crime policies that the previous Harper government that brought into place that has a significant impact, Speaker. And th that is why, as the Premier mentioned, we are very much focused on transformation yes, to ensure that we are uh, creating opportunities for inmates to get better rehabilitation and reintegration, and we are taking steps. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the role of Victoria Hospital provides some of the best patient care in the province by some of the best, smartest, sharpest physicians and nurses and health practitioners in our province. What came out yesterday was the RVH announced that they now have to cut eight million dollars. Despite the fact, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health says there are no cuts. The reality is this is yet another example. It was announced yesterday that 30 full-time jobs Minister were gone, Tourism, Culture, 24 Sport. jobs that were being advertised gone for a total of 56 previous positions gone, wiped out in the service of health care. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier continue to cut health care to make up for her waste mismanagement? Thank you. Premier. I know that the Minister of Health and Long Term Care is going to want to comment on uh, on the Royal Victoria Hospital. And Mr. Speaker, you know uh, the the funding, the base funding uh, to that hospital has increased uh, about 103 percent since 2003, Mr. Speaker. And uh, our budget, as uh, as the leader of the uh, opposition might know, has actually increased funding to hospitals, 345 million dollars, Mr. Speaker. Overall, a billion dollars more for health care, Mr. Speaker, as a result of the budget that we just brought in. We know how critical health care is to the people of Ontario. We also know that hospitals are a central part of that uh, service to people in the province, Mr. Speaker, which is why we continue year over year to increase funding to the hospitals. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Liberals have said they're going to invest in health care. What we're seeing is a very different story. In a conference call for elected officials, RVH debriefed the public servants in Simcoe County and said that based on the new formula, RVH gets $500,000 in new funding but has to cut $8 million. It is un unacceptable. 1,700 new patients last year. There are more patients. There is more health care need, and yet the hospital has to cut because of this government's mismanagement. Mr. Speaker, why is this government not providing the Royal Victoria Hospital? with the tools to serve the growing population. Why are you cutting Royal Victoria Hospital? Why are you cutting health care? Okay. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm so proud of this hospital. You know, this is a brand new hospital yeah. completed in 2013. It doubled the capacity of what the previous hospital delivered. It incorporated a cancer care program, which is among the best anywhere, Mr. Speaker. And I'm so proud of the member for Barry, who has been such a strong advocate for this hospital. It's resulted, Mr. Speaker, in the delivery. In the recently announced new cardiac care program that will be opening at Royal Victoria Hospital in the foreseeable future. And I'm so proud of the staff, including the administration. They've balanced their budget for the last seven years running. There will be no service cuts, Mr. Speaker. We've more than doubled the funding yes, for this hospital. We've more than doubled the capacity through this new hospital. This is a great news story. Thank you. I don't know where the member is trying to go with this. Thank you. Final supplementary. $8 million. Mr. Speaker, the reason that everyone in Simcoe County is livid with these cuts, livid with these $8 million cuts, is because this government is saying that they're going to invest in Stop. Okay. Uh, we'll go to warnings. All sides. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, when this government says they're investing in health care, they have no credibility because we see examples like this. The reality is they can point the member to from Barry is warned. They can point to any page in the budget, but this is not what we're seeing on the front pages of newspapers across Ontario. The reality is, just look at Simcoe County. A million dollars that was just cut from the Simcoe County Health Unit. Georgian Bay General, five million dollars cut, and they said there'd be more services provided at RVH, and now they cut RVH by eight million. The government promises investments in long-term care, and now it came out today that they're cutting $340,000 from long-term care Question. in Simcoe County. The, the mayor of Barrie called this downloading by its stealth. Right. Mr. Speaker, when will this premier, when will this premier stop pretending that she's investing in health care? This Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, apart from the 28 hospitals that they closed when they were last in government, you know, I know the leader, the, the leader of the opposition also, who tried to do this, Mr. Speaker, with Georgian Bay. Mr. Speaker, he tried to do this with Georgian Bay, where he began fear mongering, suggesting that a decision had been made to close the obstetrics unit at that hospital. In fact, that was absolutely false. There was recommendations, more than 100 of them, proposals that were put forward to the hospital in December, and among them, there is a whole series of uh, efficiencies and improvements that can be made. That was one. It's, it's among 100 proposals. It's the same with RVH, with Royal Victoria Hospital, doing a great, fantastic job. He needs to stop fear mongering and suggest. And he, in fact, he needs to start chopping, championing Chair, the hard please. work of this hospital, the people that work there, the frontline health care workers, and the positive outcomes that we're seeing. I would, I would hope that members know by now that testing my resolve uh, is, is a bad mistake. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe in universal health care? Thank you. Premier. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, reinforce, we're on warnings, and if you choose to ignore the speaker, the speaker won't ignore you. Supplementary. She should show it, Speaker. In 2014, the health minister wrote an editorial in the Globe and Mail. He said, quote, we need drug coverage to see better performance in our health system. Pharmacare also speaks to the Canadian values of fairness and equity, end quote. He Speak. The Minister of North... Uh, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry is warned. Finish, please. 
He wrote in the Toronto Star that PharmaCare was, quote, one of the most important steps we can take to rededicate ourselves to the principle of universal access to health care, end quote. Does the Premier share that belief, Speaker, what, that what Ontario needs is universal access to drug coverage? So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care uh, has been uh, an advocate and a leading voice across this country, Mr. Speaker, on the need for a pharma care system. Mr. Speaker, he is working with his colleagues across the country. He uh, he has been a very articulate advocate for uh, pharma care. We all understand, Mr. Speaker, that we need to provide for people and make sure that more people have access to the medications that they need, particularly as new medications come on uh, online, Mr. Speaker. And also, as the as the population ages, which the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. In our budget, we moved to take 170,000 seniors and make sure that they did not have any deductible that they would have to pay, Mr. Oh, yeah. Speaker. That is exactly consistent with the belief that farmer care is an important thing. Well, Stop Speaker, the, actions do speak louder than words. The Premier sent a public message when she signed her name to a call for PharmaCare. But now that the TV cameras are off and we see the real plan, instead of giving more access to affordable medication to seniors who are struggling, seniors will see the cost of their medication nearly double. That's the fact, Speaker. Yep. It's disappointing. It's extremely disappointing when Ontarians hear the Premier talking about more drugs coverage, but what they get in their real lives from this Liberal government is less coverage. Can the Premier explain why her ministers are talking about universal care what, when she talks about uni universal care, but what we see is the exact opposite, Speaker, right. the exact opposite. Right. And it's just not do, New Democrats saying that. It is CARP that's Question. saying that. Seniors organizations are saying that. Everybody recognizes it. Ontario seniors will see their cost of their medication nearly Thank double. You. Is that universal pharmacare, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you. We've had this exchange in a number of ways uh, uh, for a number of days, Mr. Speaker, and I will say once again, our, uh, our objective was to take those 100, and I think it's 173,000 seniors to make sure that they didn't have to pay a deductible, Mr. Speaker, because they were uh, the most vulnerable, Mr. Speaker. The second part of our, uh, our initiative, there's a regulation out right now. We said if we didn't get that threshold right for people who are already paying a deductible, Mr. Speaker, and an increase on that deductible, if we didn't get the threshold threshold right, we would look at it. And I assume, Mr. Speaker, that groups like CARP and uh, those organizations will be talking to us, will give us their input. But, Mr. Speaker, the thrust of our initiative was to make sure that those 173 most vulnerable seniors did no longer have to pay deductible. And that's exactly what will happen. Answer. To the Premier Speaker, you know, the reality is their budget went in the opposite direction of universal pharmacare. Speaker, there's nothing in this budget either for Northern Ontario Question. and no recognition of Question. the unique challenges facing Northerners. I trust the table as well. Please direct. Everything is more expensive in the North Speaker. People pay more for a litre of gas, for a, car a carton of milk, for a dozen eggs. They pay more to heat their homes. And now, a senior living on less than $19,500 a month in Northern Ontario is going to have to stretch every dollar even further. Does this Premier think that it is fair it is to nearly double the cost of medication for seniors in Northern Ontario? Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I have answered this question. I have said that the regulation on that particular aspect of our initiative uh, is in the public realm for consultation, Mr. Speaker, and we have said that uh, that we will look at that. But, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party has said she is proud to vote against the budget that she uh, that we just brought in, Mr. Speaker. Let me let me just look at what that. That means. Yep. Let's look at what that means. That means that this leader of the third party is proud to vote against transforming student assistance.
assistance, yeah. Mr. Speaker, which will mean free tuition for low-income families, more affordable tuition for middle-class families, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. She's proud to vote against taking action on climate change and investing uh, cap-and-trade proceeds transparently into green projects that reduce pollution, Mr. Speaker. She's proud to vote against lowering hospital parking fees. She's proud to voting against improving services for children, Answer. youth, children and youth with autism through a five-year, three hundred and thirty million dollar investment, Mr. Speaker. She's proud to vote Thank against you. all of those things. Supplementary. Up, down, up, down, up. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. I'm uh, very proud to vote against a budget that uh, grows inequality in this province, worsens our health care uh, system, worsens our uh, education system, doesn't create enough jobs for the people of this province, and turns its back on universal funding. that uh, this Premier either doesn't understand the North or she doesn't care about the North Speaker. The CEO of the Thunder Bay Hospital says that people in Thunder Bay will see health cuts because the province's funding formula don't make, doesn't make sense in the North. He said, quote, we've seen a reduction in our budget of half a million dollars last year on that formula. I think it's o it overemphasizes population growth, so populations growing in Southern Ontario tend to get more of that money than we do. That's a problem, end quote. Why is the Premier Question. ignoring the health care needs of the Northern families in this province, Speaker? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Minister. Minister of health, long -term care. Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, there seems to be a theme here. and In fact, the theme might be a cardiac one, because just like I was talking about the new acute cardiac program that we're developing at Royal Victoria, we just announced recently in the past months a brand new cardiovascular surgery and vascular surgery program at Thunder Bay it's Regional fantastic. Hospital. It's a single program, Mr. Speaker, it's actually in the partnership with, uh, with Toronto General Hospital. And I was there. I can't count. I can't remember the number of times I've been to Thunder Bay Regional Hospital for announcements there to meet with staff, frontline health care workers. There's incredible activity taking place. The research that's going on there that we're supporting as well. And it's a world, not just a province-wide, it's a worldwide, world-class health care center that we're developing in partnership with the leadership at, in Thunder Bay, including the health leadership that there, that's there. I would hope that the, the third party would recognize that, what we're developing there, which is so badly needed, but so well deserved, Mr. Speaker. Final Mr. Speaker, how out of touch this health minister is. The theme is the cuts to Ontario Hospital, Speaker. That's what the theme is. And it's not just the Thunder Bay Hospital, Speaker. The Timmins Hospital has been forced to cut $35 million over the last three and a half years. The North Bay Hospital CEO says that, quote, this year has been challenging and the next one is going to be even more so, end quote. And we know that nearly, nearly doubling drug costs is going to hit Northern seniors as well, Speaker. When will this Premier start listening to the needs of the North and making sure that Northerners get fair access to the health care that they need. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Eglinton Lawrence is warned. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I remain proud of the work that we're doing as a government in the North with our partners there throughout the health care system, the work that I referenced at Thunder Bay, the hospitals that we're renovating and building in the North as well, the fact that our 25 nurse practitioner-led clinics that exist around the province, many of those are in the North. In fact, the first was in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. But when we, if we want to talk about trends here, let's talk about the trend of them when they are in government, where they closed hundreds of mental health beds across, 13 percent of the mental health beds across this province were closed, when they delisted home care from OHIP coverage, Mr. Speaker, when they fired 3,000 nurses when they were in power, Mr. Speaker, for that short period of time, the devastating impact that they had that we've been rebuilt, rebuilding, we've been rebuilding after the, the devastation of the PC party as well. I'm proud of our investments, including $345 million new dollars for hospitals across the province, a more than 2 percent increase this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This government has a history of closing up to special interest groups and Liberal friends. Last June, the Premier committed to bringing in new rules for third-party fund advertising. Yet nothing has changed, despite her electoral reform bill passing. The Chief Electoral Officer, Greg Asenza, has repeatedly called for limiting advertising by special interest groups during election periods. Yet his calls have been ignored. 
Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier do the honourable thing, do what she personally committed to doing, which is to bring in meaningful third-party advertising reform? $6,000 a plate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier. Speaker. And I have been asked this question a number of times, in, uh, and I have said in the public realm that uh, uh, we are committed to not only, not only bringing in uh, changes in terms of third-party advertising, Mr. Speaker, but also looking at uh, political fundraising rules. We are doing that, Mr. Speaker. We will be bringing forth a plan, and uh, I look forward to the support from the parties opposite. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier, Speaker. The Liberals won't fix a system where fairness is distorted. Those were the Toronto Star's words, not mine. The Chief Electoral Officer noted that Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, New Brunswick, and the federal government have all adopted controls over third-party advertising. And as a matter of fact, Ontario remains the only place where third parties do not face advertising spending or contribution limits. It's time we level the playing field. It's time for action. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier take a break from her backroom meetings and take actual action to bring in real fairness and real reform to our system? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, we agree. We agree that there need to be changes, but I would just remind the I would remind the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that we actually are the party that has brought in changes, Mr. Speaker. In 2007, in 2007, third-party advertising rules were in, there were no rules before 2007. There were no rules at all, Mr. Speaker. We brought in rules in 2007. I have committed to bringing in further enhancements. We will do that, Mr. Speaker. In addition, the member from Dufferin Callanan is warned. I had a lot of choice. Thank you. In addition to changes on third-party advertising, Mr. Speaker, we will be looking at uh, political fundraising, and we'll be bringing in a plan as well for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My my question is to the Minister of Finance. 124, 124 workers from the Rideau Carleton Racetrack are here with us today in the gallery. They're members of the Public Service Alliance of Canada. They've been locked out of work by the OLG, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, since just before Christmas. And all because they rightly refuse to have their decent pensions gutted from their collective agreements. This government has been promising a secure income retirement through its ORPP for all Ontarians, while at the same time turning a blind eye to the OLG making cuts to their workers' superior pension plans. This is the height of hypocrisy. Absolutely. Will the minister explain? Uh, the member will withdraw. Withdraw. Mr. Explain why his Liberal government will allow the OLG to treat these workers and their, their families this way. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, um, I appreciate the concerns of the individuals who have travelled here today overnight. Um, it's a very difficult situation for them and their families. Mr. Speaker, they're here in the gallery today, as mentioned. And I want them to know that I value the work, and I think all of us in this House respect their rights. Mr. Speaker, we want everyone to be at their best. This ongoing labour disruption at the slots at Rideau is not easy for anyone. I also respect the collective bargaining process that's underway and that mediators are involved. Mr. Speaker, OLG says, and I believe they've had this discussion now, is willing to go back to the bargaining table, and I remain hopeful that this matter will be resolved as soon as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that's interesting because certainly the workers haven't heard that. Yeah. Let's, that's right. So, Speaker, let's be clear. The OLG is a crown corporation. It takes its marching orders from the government. So we have these, these workers and their families here with us today. They've been out of work since before Christmas. They're without a job. They're without a paycheck. And the OLG has even cut their health benefits. We have workers here that need medications just to function every day, and they have not had any health benefits since the lockout. All of this under the Liberal government's watch. Will the minister tell these 124 workers and their families who are here today why the Liberal government has done nothing to get the Crown Corporation back to the table and nothing to get these workers back to work? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
It's disappointing that the member opposite, from the NDP no less, is suggesting that we negotiate outside of the collective bargaining process. They themselves know fully well that that's the way it should conserve. We respect that every employee should be treated fairly and respectfully, and it's, and it's appropriate not to negotiate now outside of the process. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm this, that in fact it is the issues for dispute are around wages and pensions. I recognize that. I also recognize that the OLG and others have made a number of proposals already that has been consistent with 17 others that they've ratified, with the OPS including uh, the security services by the OPSU at the Rideau Carlton just last December or last November. The conciliatory by the Ministry of, of Labour has been in place. They've called a meeting as of last January. It's Answer. unfortunate they didn't come to an agreement. I am very hopeful, though, that they will and they'll get back to the bargaining table where it should to get this resolved. We regard that. We recognize that's important. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. New question. You better not look at me. Member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Associate Minister of Finance. Minister, I'm pleased that our government has consistently been in favour of enhancing retirement security. I know that residents in my riding of Kingston and the Islands are pleased to see our government taking a leadership role on this issue. Many people I have spoken to are concerned about their future and they recognize that too many Ontarians are not saving enough for retirement. The world of work is changing and a growing number of young workers no longer have access to a workplace pension plan. Mr. Speaker, I know the minister has made a lot of progress on the development and implementation of this important plan over the past several months. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please highlight some of the ways that the government is helping people with retirement security through the ORPP? Thank you. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the very hardworking member from Kingston and the Islands for that question. Over the past year, we have made significant progress in our commitment to build a strong and secure retirement income system for the people of Ontario. Our goal is for all Ontario employees to be part of the ORPP or a comparable plan by 20. 2020. Study after study, including ones from Canada's major financial institutions like CIBC, RBC, BMO and Sun Life, has told us that many Canadians are not saving for retirement. Mr. Speaker, the ORPP will address this challenge by ensuring that Ontario workers receive a predictable stream of income indexed to inflation and paid for life. This means that future retirees will have more disposable income to spend in their neighbourhoods, supporting local businesses in their communities. The Conference Board of Canada was also clear that accounting for all factors, consumers and the economy as a whole are better off under the ORPP. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we're showing leadership on this issue because we believe that after a lifetime of working, Ontario Thank deserve you. a dignified here, retirement. Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. I have heard some people refer to the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan incorrectly as tax or as a payroll tax. Some of these individuals who have used the term tax are sitting across the aisle with us today. Mr. Speaker, I've heard the minister tell the House that the ORPP is being designed to mirror the CPP. And according to CARP, the CPP is not run by the government and it's not a tax. Your CPP is an earned pension. CPP Investment Board, CPPIB, manages the CPP at arm's length from all levels of government and makes independent investment decisions. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please discuss this issue and further explain how a pension Question. plan is different from a tax? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. As the member suggested, there have been a number of individuals who incorrectly call pension plans a tax. In fact, it has been a common phrase used by members of the PC party, both inside and outside this House. This is misleading. This is why I was pleased to hear the Leader of the Opposition flip-flop on his position on this issue. On Monday, while defending yet another PC flip-flop, the Leader clearly stated, it's not a tax if government doesn't keep it. It's not a tax if you give it back. We have been clear. 
through legislation, all funds that are collected by the ORPP Administrative Corporation will be held in trust for members, and similar to CPP, the ORPP will be administered at arm's length from government. Here, here. I hope the leader shared his new talking points with the members of his caucus so that they too are clear that pension plans Answer. are not a tax. The ORPP would mean all Ontarians would have access to a secure retirement, not just Thank ones you. fortunate enough to have a goal. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa, and the PN Carlton. To the Premier. In 2012, her government embarked on a gaming modernization plan that cancelled the slots at the racetrack program and attempted to expand casinos across Ontario, causing the deaths of thousands of horses and the loss of thousands of rural jobs. In Ottawa, the Rideau Carlton Raceway was threatened with a downtown Ottawa casino. Only after major public backlash did the Liberals abandon that plan, or so I thought. Now, over 100 slot workers at the RCR, who are underpaid compared to their uh, counterparts across Ontario, are forced literally out into the Ottawa cold, locked out by the OLG. During the first um, weeks of this lockout, revenues from the slots at the Rideau Carlton are down $1 million from the same quarter a year ago. Is this a plan Question. to starve the Rideau Carlton Raceway of her patrons so this government can finally build a downtown Ottawa casino Thank with you. the slots and the horse track out of the way? Thank you. Labor. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I, I don't think anybody in this House enjoys when they see a strike or a lockout. No. Ontario's got an excellent record in reaching a settlement in this regard. Over 98 per cent of agreements are reached around the collective bargaining. So what we concentrate on, Speaker, is working with the parties to focus on a settlement that's going to, resu that's going to result in a fair collective agreement. That's what we want to see in this circumstance. That's what we're working for at the Ministry of Labour. Nothing would please me more. I'm sure nothing would please all members of this House anymore to see that agreement reached. The way that agreement reached, Speaker, is to bring people back to the table. I'm pleased to inform, Speaker, I can answer, I think I can expand a little bit more on the supplementary. I'm actively engaged with the mediator in this regard. He's reaching out to the parties as I speak, Speaker. Thank you. I'm going back to the Premier because the motive of, of what they're doing is to close down the Rideau Carlton Raceway and put these people out of a job and put the rest of those horse people out of a job so they can bring down a downtown Ottawa casino. First, the government attacked the rural roots of the people of Nepean Carlton at a half century old uh, racetrack because they eliminated the revenue sharing agreement. Now the government is forcing these folks here today out of unpaid, uh, underpaid employees out of work, and it has cost the OLG a million dollars. And the OLG is the only gaming corporation in the entire world that goes out of its way to lose money. They are biting off their uh, nose to spite their face. So I question the Premier again, and I would like a response for my constituents. Will the government recognize that it is being unfair to its employees, question. or will the government continue and uh, to uh, force out the Rideau Carlton Raceway and share their Thank secret you. plan for an auto Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I'm not sure it's particularly helpful in this regard to try to solve the collective agreement in this House, sir. Speaker. Each of the parties has a record. We know which party was the one that was trying to get rid of public service jobs during the last election. That was very clear. But we're at a point right now, Speaker. We're at a point right now, Speaker, where we have a group that is locked out and we have, uh, we have two parties that aren't at the table. Speaker, the role of the Ministry of Labour, and I would think the hope of everybody in this House, is that both sides will agree to return to that table to do the hard work, to make the tough choices that result in collective agreements that, in, that, uh, that at the end of it all, ensure that people have good employment in the province of Ontario, long-lasting, stable employment, Speaker. So I don't think there's any sense throwing stones about the motives behind this issue, Speaker. The member, from, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Wrap up, please. Thank Sentence. You. Clearly, Speaker, what we all should aspire to is to get these two parties back to the table to uh, ensure they Thank complete you. an agreement the way we have in 98% of the cases. Thank you. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. 
Thank you. Good morning to you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister, this week is the annual Prospectors and Developers Conference. Your ministry hosted a number of industry reception with companies working in the province. Last week, a report was released which states that Ontario is lagging on exploration permits. It went further to say a quarter of industry respondents believe permit approval times had lengthened considerably in Ontario in the last 10 years. On the level of transparency in approval process, again, no surprise that Ontario's transparency ranks amongst the worst. When we are losing investment, we are losing companies, we are losing jobs with the every passing minute. So my question to the minister is why on earth is your government making the permit processing even longer and more frustrating? Thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. May I say it was a tremendous week out of the Prospector and Developers Association Conference and a very positive one in terms of the meetings that we had, not with its companies, but with Indigenous leadership and for with all kind and the federal government as well. And may I say, um, as we move forward with the our mineral development strategy, our goal is to remain the leader in sustainable mineral development all across the world. And certainly in, in Ontario, we are very proud of the fact that we are uh, number one still in mineral exploration. We are still number one in terms of mineral production, uh, and that's incredibly important to us. In terms of your specific question, we are working closely as we can to be as open to as we chair, can please. to move the permit and plans and permit process forward, and we'll continue to do that uh, in the best fashion we can, working Answer. closely with industry. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, industry reported that the province was slow and far behind other provinces with synchronizing permitting and industry milestones. The criticism has been abundant. The AG re report found government has spent $13 million as a, and has nothing to show for it. Cliff said they had zero hope and that every investment made here was a disaster. Sources inside NORAD indicate they have threatened to suspend work. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce also reported lack of investment in the Ring of Fire. First Nation leaders leadership have publicly expressed concerns that the provincial government is violating their agreement. Speaker, inclusion, investment, infrastructure, truth and reconciliation is the path forward. These are wise words at PDAC opening ceremony from Regional Chief Day. Minister, this is no longer a game of crying wolf. When will you show leadership with this file? Thank you. Mr. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, again, we had an extraordinary relationship building exercise with the Ring of Fire de development. There's no doubt about it. The work that we're doing with the Matawa First Nations is unprecedented. The fact that we signed a, a regional framework agreement is unprecedented. The work that we're doing moving forward is going to make the, position ourselves so that we are ready to move forward. The work we're doing with industry, whether it was with Norm Resources or any of the other companies that are related to investment in the Ring of Fire, is absolutely moving forward in a positive way. So you can be as negative as you want to be. Order. We're going to continue to work for positively with our with our, our all of our, our partners and stakeholders, including industry, including First Nations, including the Métis Nation, and we are going to recognize that we can be the top mineral destination for, for mining and across, across around the world, and that's our goal with moving forward with the Ring of Fire as well, a project that Answer. when it comes to fruition is going to be a huge economic benefit to so many people Thank across you. the province of Ontario. Question. member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, I've always been passionate about the television, film and broadcasting industries. In fact, before getting into politics, I worked as a reporter, producer and anchor for several stations, including the CBC, CTV, TVO and Omni, and worked on several documentary films. As a former board member for the Real World Film Festival, I've seen firsthand how good storytelling and filmmaking can move us to action. TIFF, Real World, and even the Milton Film Festival in my riding are just some of the wonderful festivals that provide Ontario filmmakers with a platform for their work. We have some amazing talent. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport tell the House how our government is encouraging the development of our rapidly growing television and film sector? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the MPP from Halton for her continued work and advocacy for our creative sector here in the province of Ontario. 
And Mr. Speaker, there's no question that this government is a proud supporter of the creative sector here uh, in Ontario. Yesterday, we made uh, some changes in the Interactive Digital Media Fund, and also uh, today we uh, we shared some great news uh, with the uh, the sector. And Ontario's had a great year. Ontario played a huge role in the uh, in the, at the Oscars, winning uh, Best Picture uh, for uh, a film that was filmed here in Ontario. And of course, uh, Best Actress went to uh, uh, to uh, an actor for an actor from the uh, movie uh, Room, which was uh, co-produced here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we know that there's TV productions uh, that take place here, like Murdoch Mysteries, Suits and Rain, and we'll continue to support our, uh, our film and television sector through our budget, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that it continues yes, to sir. build on, uh, on, uh, on that sector here in the province of Ontario. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, TV and film. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your hard work in this sector. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I saw the film Spotlight and Room, and I was proud to discover that they were filmed right here in our province. Mr. Speaker, we know that the number one priority of our government is to grow the economy and create jobs for Ontarians. And we know that the film and television sectors are important and thriving industries in Ontario. I'm pleased to hear from the Minister that our budget and our continued investment in TV and film is leading to record-breaking GDP and job numbers. I'm proud our government is supporting this vital sector and the talented producers, directors, actors, cinematographers, and industry experts living and working in our province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the members of this House more about our support for this important Question. sector? Question. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was uh, happy to announce today that the TV and film tax credits attracted a record-breaking level of production in 2015, making it the best year for film and television in the history of this province. The TV and film sector here in the province contributed over $1.5 billion to our local economy, generating uh, 4,500 new jobs here in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, I know that we'll have continued growth here with our con continued support by the government. That means more local jobs, more economic growth, and increased economic uh, foreign investment. For every actor in front of the camera, Mr. Speaker, there are a dozen carpenters, lighting technicians, uh, sound special effects, post-production. There's so many people involved in the production, and we're proud as a government, Mr. Speaker, to support film and television here in the province Answer. of Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. The question, the member, the member from uh, what was, uh, Prince Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Two years ago, Speaker, I introduced a private member's resolution to reform joint and several liability for municipalities. My motion received unanimous, unanimous consent from MPPs of all parties, even Liberals. Yet here we stand over two years later, and the government has done absolutely nothing. Municipalities' insurance premiums remain high. In fact, it was brought up again at last month's Roma Ogre conference. So, Speaker, I asked the minister, why won't the government respect the will of municipalities across Ontario and respect the resolution passed in this House by all parties over two years ago? Sure. Thank you. Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, to say that we have done nothing, it's not exactly uh, correct because there has been there is has been a lot of review that has been done. You know, I know the member uh, might want to withdraw that. Thank you. There has been a lot of consultation that was done, and you know what, Mr. Speaker, there was no support except from the uh, insurance company and some of the municipality. So the, uh, the legal organization, those who uh, represent uh, those individuals that have been uh, injured or that they, uh, they have disabled uh, resulting from uh, one of these injuries, were very much yes, against the, uh, the uh, uh, joint and several liability, any change in, in that. So Thank I you. will continue on this. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Liberals have turned their backs on municipalities. What a disgrace. But if the minister won't help municipalities across the province, what about her own constituents? In 2008, there was a tragic incident in Ottawa where a drunk driver slammed into a bus. Because the bus driver was driving six kilometers over the speed limit, 
and because he apparently picked the wrong moment to check his mirrors, the bus driver was found partially at fault. And now Ottawa taxpayers are on the hook for $2 million. This case represents municipalities' worst fears. Here is my question, Speaker. If other provinces and states can make sensible reforms to their systems, what's stopping Ontario? Is it because, is it because the Liberals' so-called consultation sought input question. only from trial lawyers? Ah. Is it because they totally excluded insurers and municipalities? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you as I said, Mr. Speaker, there was a wide consultation, and uh, you know uh, what uh, the uh, the review of the consultation uh, show us that uh, you know what the uh, the opposition want to do is to switch the burden, you know, from the municipality to the injured individual. On this side of the house, we don't agree with that. So unless you know there is a, there is a, you know a suggestion that will not do that. You know, I'm open to look at other uh, proposals, but so far the proposal that came to us was to do exactly that, to shift the burden from the injured individual to uh, the uh, to the uh, to shift the burden of the municipality to the injured individual. We're not ready to do that, and we're not going to Answer. do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? from Nickelbell. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to ask my question to the, pr the Premier. Since the Anishinaabe Asking Nation of Sioux Lookout and the Chiefs Committee on Health declared the health emergency for First Nation in Sioux Lookout and across the NAN Territory. As Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler said, and I quote, children are dying, lives are at risk. Communities are in a state of crisis. Many First Nations lack the basics needed to deliver proper health care. And as the declaration of emergency states, people continually encounter the effects of federal and provincial jurisdictional squabbling, leading to inadequate access to health care. Chiefs are calling on all levels of government, and that includes this provincial government, to commit to immediate action to address this urgent crisis. It has been too long we Question. What has the Premier done to address the urgent health care crisis in the NAN territory. Thank you. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I appreciate the question, Mr. Speaker, uh, and um, it is true that, uh, that the NAN nation the, uh, in the Sioux Lookout region uh, issued uh, this public health emergency uh, statement. Uh, I think it was one day after, it might have even been the same day, Mr. Speaker, that I uh, organized a conference call with Grand Chief Elvin Fiddler, with uh, Regional Grand Chief Isidore Day. In fact, there were quite a number of chiefs uh, that were represented on the conference call with myself because I wanted on a very urgent basis to uh, begin to address the valid concerns that they have uh, raised uh, through their call for support and help uh, in health care. Uh, they also uh, um, uh, emphasize the importance, which we of course agree with, of working closely with our federal partners at all levels of government, our First Nations, the provincial government Answer. and the federal government. We work together uh, um, uh, in a collaborative fashion to address uh, the issues uh, concerning public health and other health, health issues in an effective manner. Supplementary. Speaker, an urgent health care crisis demands more than a phone call. Community in northwestern Ontario and across the NAN territories have suffered from inadequate health care access for decades. And the chiefs are clear they don't want this to continue any longer. They are calling for immediate action, not phone calls, by the government of Ontario. They want them to approve the long-term care facility in Sioux Lookout. They want us, the government, you to increase resources to support mental health and prevent suicide, and they want the government to comply with Jordan principle and make sure that children in particular have access to health care. For too long, government at all levels, including the provincial government, have failed to address the crisis Question. in First Nations community. These failures need to stop right now, Speaker. Will the Premier take immediate action, not calls, to stop Thank this you. First Nations crisis? 
Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that immediate response in the conference call came uh, one day after I addressed the annual health summit of our First Nations uh, leaderships and frontline health care workers, where I outlined our plan going forward to work with them. And I wish I had hoped, in fact, I'm surprised it took two weeks, and she hasn't done this privately with me either. I'm surprised it took her two weeks to actually address this, either publicly or privately. Uh, this is such an important issue. So we're developing an action plan in response to every single issue that's referenced in their press release. It was informed further by that urgent and important phone call. We've committed to uh, an in-person meeting as well and creating a process, an in-person meeting that will include uh, Federal Minister Jane Philpott. We're developing an action plan, but we're doing that in collaboration with the First Nations partners. If she's unsure of the government's commitment to this, I suggest she talk to those same First Nations leaders that I have, and they, Thanks, I believe, will defend our resolve. Thank you. New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs. Ontario is currently home to approximately 2 million people over the age of 65, and over the next 25 years, that number will more than double. As our Minister knows, seniors play an active and an important role in our province's communities and our economy. Recently, in the budget, this government proposed changes that will benefit seniors and assist them in living healthy and happy lives in their retirement years. Question for Mr. Speaker, through Mr. Speaker, is to the minister, would this minister inform us how the House of recent, on recent items announced for seniors in the 1916 budget are in place? Thank you. Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Ajax, Speaker and Speaker, and I have to say that he is absolutely right, Speaker. Uh, last week, in 18-degree uh, weather, uh, the member was there shivering, uh, but doing his job representing the seniors, the people of Ajax, Pickering, and I have to congratulate him because they were just groundbreaking in other senior buildings. So. I know what he's talking about, Speaker, and it's absolutely right. Indeed, Speaker, the 2016-17 uh, budget ensured that our seniors have access to programs and services they need, uh, such as, Speaker, and this is important, uh, $250 million in home care and community care, another additional $75 million over the next three years uh, in community-based residential hospital and palliative care, Speaker an additional $10 million speaker, annually in support of our residents, helping them with dementia and other complex behavioral and neurological conditions. And speaker, above all, uh, 130,000 seniors will benefit Sir. when they go and visit or themselves go to the hospital, 50% reduction in a hospital parking. This Thank is you. what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and perhaps at this time I should correct my, my uh, year of record, and I said, <laughs> whatever I said, it was, of course, 2016. I'm slightly like, like Panasonic, slightly ahead of my time. So I'd like to thank the minister for his response. I know our government has a plan to create jobs and grow the economy, and we recognize that our greatest strength is our people. I'm pleased that in the budget we've allocated funding to ensure our seniors have access to programs and services they need, and I look forward to seeing so many citizens across this province and in my riding of Ajax Pickering benefit from the 2016 budget. It's important that seniors remain healthy and independent for as long as possible and to feel safe and supported. Question: Can the minister responsible for seniors' affairs please explain what is being proposed for the shingles vaccine. Question. Thank you, Thank you Minister. Uh, speaker, the member, it's right again. Uh, our seniors, they want to live engaged, they want to live active, and they want to live an independent life as long as possible. And absolutely, Speaker, uh, the uh, uh, member is right again when he says that uh, we want to create jobs and, and uh, what's in the budget. Speaker, $160 billion to create 110,000 jobs uh, I think it's very important. Wow. I have to say, Speaker, that uh, uh, let me try and say this in, in a very nice way, Speaker, that since the beginning, our Premier, our Premier Speaker, has been preaching with more fervor than an evangelist preacher. Our Premier Speaker, 
has been preaching more than an evangelist preacher about jobs and the economy, Speaker. Yes. So this is nothing new. But there is more in the budget, yes, sir. I've been after the Minister of Health, the Premier, and the Minister of Finance to include shingles uh, for our seniors. Thank you. So they are saying. Thank you. Your question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thanks, Speaker, my uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, Minister, people in Chatham, Kent, and around the province are outraged that there is an application before the court to be heard tomorrow to euthanize 21 dogs seized in a dog fighting operation in Tilbury. This has sparked an outpouring of support for the dogs and outrage towards the province. The dogs rescued from the Michael Vick's high profile 2007 fighting ring have proven to the world that fighting dogs can be successfully rehabilitated. A Rhode Island woman who owns one of those 22 dogs saved from Michael Vick's estate and who also runs a rescue for fighting dogs has offered to lend her expertise to the province free of charge, Thank you do, sir. but has heard no response. The speaker to the minister, why does the province think these dogs are different? Why don't they deserve a second chance. Question. Thank you. <laughs> Minister Kennedy, Sink and Personal Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. The member is asking about a court process, Speaker, that is underway involving the OSPCA. We understand that this is a very challenging issue and many individuals and organizations are concerned. As the Speaker, I'm sure as the member knows, there is currently an application to the court by the OSPCA for permission to euthanize 21 of the 31 pit bull dogs seized from an alleged dog fighting operation citing risk for public safety. However, Speaker, the remaining dogs are being rehabilitated for relocation outside the province. Speaker, our government takes the care and protection of animals in Ontario very seriously, and we are proud to have some of the higher, high standards. But, Speaker, we have to be mindful that OSPCA is an independent charitable organization that provides a number of services, just, such as animal shelters, veterinary care, and spray uh, neuter clinics. Contrary to public reports, yes, Speaker, the government of Ontario does not have le legislative or regulatory authority to direct the OSP OSPCA to take or not to take any uh, any action in this instance. This Thank is the matter before the courts, and that's where it should be. Done. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Uh, I own a rescue dog, and I love him very dearly. Ontario's archaic animal laws are making this issue more complicated. The animal sanctuary dog tails has offered to help, begging the minister a grant to grant a special designation so they can take these dogs in. They've taken dogs in the province uh, that the province has, in, has deemed unadoptable before, and they are willing to do it again. They've even offered a forever home for any dogs that cannot be rehabilitated. No stone, minister, should be left unturned. So, Speaker, to the minister, Will the minister take every possible step to save these dogs' lives and grant such a designation? Minister, save the dogs. Speaker, I also do have a rescue dog, which my family and I love very, very dearly. As I said, Speaker, earlier, that OSPCA is an independent charitable organization that provides a number of services when it comes to the welfare of animals in our province. Additionally, Speaker, the OSPCA Act, which is a legislation of this parliament, authorizes the SPCA inspectors and agents to enforce any law pertaining to the welfare of animals. Please, Speaker, may also enforce these laws. As I said earlier again, Speaker, I want to repeat that the government of Ontario does not have legislative or regulatory authority to direct the OSPCA to take the member from Leeds Grenville can turn his chair away from me after he hits, but it doesn't mean I don't hear you. Uh, and we're very close to a vote, and I would love him to be able to exercise that voting right. Finish, please. Again, Speaker, the government does not have any authority to, uh, to tell OSPA what to do or what not to do, or to exempt a private facility from Answer. the requirements of the Dog or Owners Liability Act for the purposes of transferring ownership of the DEX dogs to such a facility. Thank you. The member from Scarborough uh, Agent Court for Thank a point of order. Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to welcome our two American guests visiting the legislature, former uh, Minnesota Senator Jane Kretz and the NCEL, no, NCEL 
Executive Director Jeff Moll for visiting Queen's Park today. Welcome to Queen's Park. Welcome. Member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to uh, introduce to the legislature today uh, two residents from the great riding of Chatham, Kent, Essex, Wayne and Jennifer Black. Welcome to <laughs> Queen's Park. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to the motion for allocation of time on Bill 173, an act to implement budget measures and to enact uh, other amended uh, various statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bill. Yeah.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On Tuesday, March 8, 2016, Mr. Nackney moved Government Notice Motion Number 63. Mr. Clark then moved the, that the motion be amended as follows. That the paragraph beginning that the standing suspense dispense. We are now dealing with Mr. Clark's amended amendment to the motion. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Harry, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cove. Mr. Cove. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeek. Mr. McMeek. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantaw. Mr. Vantaw. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 24, the nays are 67. The ayes being 24 and the nays being 67, I declare the amendment lost. Are the members ready to vote on the main motion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Nackby has moved government notice uh, of motion number 63. Is it the pleasure of the House of the motion carry? No. I heard a no. Are those in favour, please, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Calling the members, this will be the uh, five minute bell.
All those in favour of the motion, as a, uh, have all those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time. You are recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Van Mayer. Van Mayer. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Moro. Mr. Moro. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domer. Ms. Domer. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Madame Jolinat. Madame Jolinat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. 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 Fife. Mr.